Welcome to George McDonald and Us. This is Catherine. And this is Sean. And today on the George McDonald and Us podcast, it is February still, and so we are going to be reading his poem and slash prayerful reflection called February, which is from a book of strife in the form of the diary of an old soul. And it's called February. Yeah. The Yep, the reflection is called February, mm-hmm. and the section is, and oh. as, like I say, as of this recording, February is just about finished, and I thought we would take a moment to reflect on February with George MacDonald and explore why he titled this one February based on the content of the poem and reflection and prayer. I was curious because it's... It's called In the Form of a Diary of an Old Soul. And so I was curious how old George MacDonald was when he wrote this. And I don't know, I guess, when he wrote it, but it was published in 1880 when he was 56. But he dies at the age of 81. And, you know, obviously he didn't know when he was going to die. So a part of me wonders, did he feel old at the age of 56? That's a good question. You know, and... Little did he know that he would probably look back and think, wow, I was actually young back then because he does make it to 81. And I don't know what the typical life expectancy was for a Scottish man back in that day, or and maybe it's no different than it is today. And But, you know, I, I just, I wonder what his relationship with death was. Does it come up in a lot of his work? That's a good question. I guess not. It does, yeah. Yeah. It does. You think it does? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep, it does. And then I thinking of Castle Warlock. There's death in that book. Um the other one there, like Sir Gibby. There's death in that book. So, yeah, it's definitely there. Yeah, well, I mean, this I, I guess we'll get to that. But, you know, this this poem deals with some of those topics. And, and it is February, which is still a bit of winter. I mean, I think it's the beginning of spring, typically. And, um, and yet it is still wintered. It's a little bit of both. At least for us in Minnesota, it would be... It would definitely still be winter. Although today it was 60 degrees. And this is... I have never had a winter like this in my entire life here in Minnesota. It's just been so mild, and I do really love it. And we have had some rain, too, so I'm not, like, super panicking that it's going to be drought. But we, we definitely need more rain, but we've had at least some, enough to keep keep us kind of from panicking right now. So without further ado, Sean is going to read the poem for us tonight. I, to myself have neither power nor worth, patience nor love, nor anything right good. My soul is a poor land, plenteous in dearth. Here blades of grass, there a small herb for food, a nothing that would be something if it could. But if obedience, Lord, in me do grow, I shall one day be better than I know. The worst power of an evil mood is this, It makes the bastard self seem in the right. Self, self the end, the goal of human bliss. But if the Christ self in us be the might of saving God, why should I spend my force with a dark thing to reason of the light? Not push it rough aside and hold obedient course. Back still it comes to this. There was a man who said, I am the truth, the life, the way. Shall I pass on or shall I stop and hear? Come to the Father, but by me none can. What then is this? Am I not also one of those who live in fatherless dismay? 
I stand, I look, I listen, I draw near. My Lord, I find that nothing else will do, but follow where thou goest, sit at thy feet, and where I have thee not, still run to meet. Roses are scentless, hopeless are the morns, rest is but weakness, laughter crackling thorns. If thou the truth, do not make them the true. Thou art my life, O Christ, and nothing else will do. Thou art here in heaven, I know, but not from here, although thy separate self do not appear. If I could part the light from out the day, there I should have thee, but thou art too near. How finely walking, when thou art the way, O present Christ, make my eyes keen as stings, to see thee at thy heart, the glory even of things. That thou art nowhere to be found, agree wise men, whose eyes are but for surfaces, men with eyes opened by the second birth, to whom the seen, husk of the unseen is, descry the the soul of everything on earth. Who know thy ends, thy means and motions see, eyes made for glory soon discover thee. Thou near then, I draw near to thy feet, and sitting in thy shadow look out on the shine, ready at thy first word to leave my seat. Not thee, thou goest to, from every clod into thy footprint flows the indwelling wine, and in my daily bread, keen-eyed, I greet its being's heart, the very body of God. Thou wilt interpret life to me and men, art, nature, yea, my own soul's mysteries, bringing truth out clear, joyous to my kin, fair as the morn trampling the dull night, then the lone hillside shall hear exultant cries, the joyous see me joy, the weeping weep, the watching smile as death breathes on me his cold sleep. I search my heart, I search and find no faith, hidden he may be in its many folds. I see him not revealed in all the world, duty's firm shape thins to a misty wraith. No good seems likely, to and fro I am hurled, I have no stay, only obedience holds, I haste, I rise, I do the thing he saith. Thou wouldst now have thy man crushed back to clay. It must be, God, thou hast a strength to give. To him that fain would do what thou dost say. Else how shall any soul repentant live? Old griefs and new fears hurrying on dismay. Let pain be what thou wilt, kind and degree. Only in pain calm thou my heart with thee. I will not shift my ground like Moab's king, but from this spot whereon I stand I pray. From this same barren rock to thee I say, Lord, in my commonness, in this very thing that haunts my soul with folly, through the clay, of this my pitcher see the lamp's dim flake, and hear the blow that would the pitcher break. Be thou the well by which I lie and rest. Be thou my tree of life, my garden ground. Be thou my home, my fire, my chamber blessed. My book of wisdom loved of all the best. O be my friend, each day still newer found, as the eternal days and nights go round. Nay, nay, thou art my God, in whom all loves are bound. Two things at once thou knowest I cannot think, when busy with the work thou givest me. I cannot consciously think then of thee. Then why, when next thou lookest over the brink of my horizon, should my spirit shrink, reproached and fearful, nor to greet thee run? 
Can I be two when I am only one? My soul must unawares have sunk awry. Some care, poor eagerness, ambition of work. Some old offense that unforgiving did lurk. Or some self-gratulation, soft and sly. Something not thy sweet will, not the good part. While the home guard looked out, stirred up the old murk. And so I gloomed away from thee, my heart. Therefore I make provision, ere I begin, to do the thing thou givest me to do. Praying, Lord, wake me oftener, lest I sin. Amidst my work, open thine eyes on me, that I may wake and laugh and know and see. Then with healed heart afresh catch up the clue, and singing drop into my work anew. If I should slow diverge and listless stray into some thought, feeling, or dream unright, O watcher, my backsliding soul affray, let me not perish of the ghastly blight. Be thou, O life eternal, in me light. Then merest approach of selfish or impure shall start me up alive, awake, secure. Lord, I have fallen again a human clod, Selfish I was, and heedless to offend, stood on my rights. Thy own child would not send away his shreds of nothing for the whole God. Wretched to thee who savest, lo, I bend. Give me the power to let my rag rights go, and the great wind that from thy gulf doth blow. Keep me from wrath, let it seem ever so right. My wrath will never work thy righteousness. Up, up the hill, to the whiter than snow shine. Help me to climb, and dwell in pardon's light. I must be pure as thou, or ever less. Then thy design of me, therefore incline, my heart to take men's wrongs as thou takest mine. Lord, in thy spirit's hurricane, I pray. Strip my soul naked, dress it then thy way. Change for me all my rags to cloth of gold. Who would not poverty for riches yield? A hovel sell to buy a treasure field. Who would a mess of porridge careful hold against the universe's birthright old? Help me to yield my will in labor even, nor toil on toil, greedy of doing heap. Fretting I can not more than me is given, That with the finest clay my wheel runs slow, Nor lets the lovely thing the shapely grow, That memory what thought gives it cannot keep, And nightly rhymes ere morn like cystus petals go. Tis shall thy will be done for me or mine, And I be made a thing not after thine, my own and dear in paltriest details, shall I be born of God or of mere man, be made like Christ or on some other plan? I let all run, set thou and trim my sails, home then my course, let blow whatever gales. With thee on board each sailor is a king, nor I mere captain of my vessel then. But hair of earth and heaven eternal child, Daring all truth, nor fearing anything, Mighty in love, a servant of all men, Resenting nothing, taking rage and blare Into the godlike silence of a loving care. I cannot see, my God, a reason why From morn to night I go not gladsome free. For if thou art what my soul thinketh thee, there is no burden but should lightly lie. No duty but a joy at heart must be, love's perfect will can be nor sore nor small. For God is light, in him no darkness is at all. Tis something thus to think and have to trust, but ah, my very heart, God-born, should lie. Spread to the light, clean, clear of mire and rust, 
and like a sponge drink the divine sunbeams. What resolution then, strong, swift, and high, what pure devotion or to live or die, and in my sleep what true, what perfect dreams. There is a misty twilight of the soul, a sickly eclipse, low brooding over a man, when the poor brain is as an empty bowl, and the thought spirit, weariful and wan, turning from which yet it loves the best, sinks moveless with life, poverty oppressed. Watch then, O Lord, thy feebly glimmering coal. I cannot think, in me is but a void. I have felt much and want to feel no more. My soul is hungry for some poorer fare, some earthly nectar gold not unalloyed, the little child that's happy to the core will leave his mother's lap, run down the stair, play with the servants, is his mother annoyed? I would not have it so, weary and worn, why not to thee run straight and be at rest, motherward, with toy anew, or garment torn, the child that late forsook her changeless breast, runs to home's heart, the heaven that's heavenliest. Enjoy our sorrow, feebleness our might, peace our commotion, be thou, Father, my delight. The thing I would say still comes forth with doubt and difference. Is it that thou shapest my ends? Or is it only the necessity of stubborn words that shift sluggish about, warping my thought as it the sentence bends, have thou a part in it, O Lord, and I shall say a truth, if not the thing I try. Gather my broken fragments to a whole, as these four quarters make a shining day, into thy basket for my golden bowl. Take up the things that I have cast away, in vice or indolence or unwise play. Let mine be a merry, all-receiving heart, but make it a whole with light in every part. Thanks. That's, that's deep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I kind of struggle with it. Well, I had to pour another glass of wine before we unpack this poem, and it is, um, it's really good wine. It's sent to Julia Malbec with organic grapes. It's one of my favorite wines. I just wanted to start by saying something that's kind of tongue-in-cheek, which is, you know, I thought Christians were supposed to be kind of dull and simple and we weren't supposed to have any sort of self-reflecting capabilities. We we don't know how to wrestle with God or the shadow. And, and yet here we have George MacDonald clearly wrestling with God and a shadow and the complexity of his inner life, I think, is really on display here. Yeah, definitely. And his awareness what, of it. Yeah, what were you going to say? I I kind of just struggle with this one, understanding exactly what's going on. But um, So overall, you just think that this is a struggle? I think it's a reflection internally. of... A struggle. Yes, I do. And I think about why he titled it February. And to be fair, I haven't read the other months in this book of strife in the form of a diary of an old soul. But as I was reading it, it did remind me of a book I, I talked about in a previous episode called Winters in the World, an Anglo-Saxon journey or understanding of the season and I wanted to share some some scraps of Anglo-Saxon poetry from that book about winter but I can't find it but I did jot down some of my thoughts and they understood winter as like an invading army and that occurred both in the inner life and in the outer life this feeling of being trapped this feeling of 
having to see everything around you die and be barren and to feel that also in an inner level. And there's just this this great stripping away of everything. And it did remind me of this poem and it even starts out with that. It's like the worst power of an evil mood is this. It makes the bastard self seem in the right. Self, self, the end, the goal of human bliss. He describes himself as a broken bowl, as common as, you know, his his soul is being haunted with folly and There's just this wrestling with that. He has fallen again, a, a human selfish clod, selfish I was to offend. And for the Anglo-Saxons, the response to winter was the Mead Hall, where you're still, it's still winter, so there's still that going on. And it's that very wintry thing, though, that makes the Mead Hall so great because the mead hall was warm it was sheltered there was a fire obviously there was mead there were stories being told and this is the very setting that the tale of beowulf is told which beowulf has to go into the depths and and fight grendel's mother Um, he has to go into the very heart of winter one could say but also in February, you know, and this is, I think, reflected in George MacDonald's poem, or two, it is the beginning of spring. And the Anglo-Saxon um, people, when, when Christianity was really integrated into their culture, there's a lot of feast days that have to do with light. So Candlemas is in February. There is, um, for us even today, there's St. Blaise's Feast Day where we get our throats blessed with candles. So there is this, this light that is suddenly being introduced. Like the days are getting longer even. And in the, in the, the spiritual level, like the two were always united for the Anglo-Saxons, even when they were pagans really. There is like all of a sudden this introducing of the hope of light that's reflected in in these feast days in the church that occur in February. But I think the point though is too though it doesn't it doesn't erase the weeping. It doesn't erase winter. It doesn't get rid of it. It just is another way to relate to it. And you know, George MacDonald does play with imagery of light in his poem, I notice. Well, I think about even the very last line, but make it a whole with light in every part. Mm-hmm. I have so much more to say about that last stanza and line later on, but I guess I just want to sit with his struggle for now because we can't we can't skip over winter. No, I was reading about Scotland in February and it says even though the days are getting longer and there is more light, it's usually overcast, mm. so it's hard to recognize that they're getting longer. Or, yeah, the days are getting longer. So. That's its own kind of torture. <laughs> yeah. It's the second coldest month that they have, mm. temperature wise. It's torture to know that the light is there and then to have it veiled. Mm-hmm. And for George MacDonald, I see this coming through in his poem where he's he's almost like begging God. It's like, look, I have to do my work. And when I do my work, I forget about you. And then when I see you <clears throat> appearing, I am filled with guilt, kind of, because I have forgotten you. And so... Just once in a while, shine down upon me. It's almost like he's asking for that overcast Mm -hmm. February cloud to just let loose one tiny little beam of light on him in this month of his soul. And I don't know about, if any of our listeners are in cold climates, maybe you know what I'm talking about, but I became a different person the other day with my kids because... 
I had found that coveted spot in a window when the sun is shining through it. It's almost like there's a little fire on your back or something, or it's so perfect and warm. And I literally have it never, I never have time to just sit in a spot like that in the window in the sun. And so I decided just to, to claim it, just to say, nope, like I'm not moving from this spot. And our little girl, she was so crafty. She, I think she made up some sort of dire need for me to attend to. And then when I came back, she had stolen it. Like she, she, she must have seen how much I was enjoying yeah. it and how much I, and then I mean, I, I did kick her out. I was like, no, I mean, there was plenty of room for her to sit next to me, I guess, but I just, I did want my spot there. And so anyway, maybe some of our listeners know what I'm talking about where it's, it's just been winter and then this time of year you can feel the sun and not to have that is hard. Mm-hmm. But I like, I, I guess I like how George McDonald, he does sort of, in a way, he does like the Beowulf type thing, which is like just the real encounter with the winter. He lives in, in fatherless dismay. And he's standing, he's looking, he's listening, he draws near. It's like he knows that Christ is here. Thou art here in heaven, I know, but not from here. Although thy separate self do not appear, if I could part the light from out the day, there I should have thee, but thou art too near. How find thee walking when thou art the way, O present Christ, make my eyes keen as stings, to see thee at their heart, the glory even of things. And so I feel him. It's like, he has tasted something at some point, like that elusive joy that William Blake talks about. And it's like he's tasted it. And so when it's not there, he knows that it's there. But when it's not there, it's so sad to not have it there once you have tasted it. And he's... He's yearning for it. He's searching for it. And yet, it's winter. So you're saying the winter is preventing him from seeing it? Yeah. I think the sun, it's like, you know, it, it's. I think it's like a relationship almost with the sun during winter. You know th- what the sun is. You know what it feels like. Mm-hmm. Um warm weather and just the ability to go outside and enjoy a walk and and some days you just really want that and you really crave it and you know what it's like and so when it's not there it's it makes it all the more hard having experienced it I think but on the flip side of that and this is where I think the Anglo-Saxon mead hall is such a great analogy, is that those parts, the winter is necessary, though. It's like these these absences or these, um, well, he doesn't call it the dark night of the soul, but he, he, mm-hmm. what, he calls it the eclipse. There, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. There is a misty twilight of the soul. A sickly eclipse, low brooding o'er a man, when the poor brain is as an empty bowl, and the thought spirit, weariful and wan, turning from that which yet it loves the best, sinks moveless with life poverty oppressed. Watch then, O Lord, my feebly glimmering coal. So there is this necessary death of the sun, of summer, of spring, of autumn, of the thought spirit. There is this death of feeling like, you know, you were graced and you have this intimate relationship with the Lord. That all does have to die so that those things can become more real or more meaningful or just more 
Yeah, that those things can almost like be purified. I mean, the, is that what he's saying? You think? Well, I don't know if it is what he's saying. I but don't that know is either. what I, I believe, and that's why I believe he is willing to say these things in the poem. Like, I think that's why he's willing to confront the misty twilight of the soul. And what do you do? It's like, at first he turns to obedience. Well, that doesn't really help. What does he say? I mean, at first it does, but then he calls it a feeble thread. I'll have to find that part of the poem at some point. But I like how he says, even obedience has its its limitations. Or I mean, there there is no 10-step formula to escape winter. There's Job... There's Prince Yvonne weeping. There's Psyche weeping. There is just sitting in the discomfort of winter. And then you go to the Mead Hall and you appreciate the Mead Hall even more. You appreciate the light more. I don't think he's saying that, though. I don't care if he's saying that or not. But what I like, but I think that that is what. Well, what do you think he's saying? What? Well, I think he's saying basically it shouldn't matter at all your circumstances that it's like in the 23rd stanza here. He says, I cannot see my God a reason why from morn to night I go not glad some free for if thou art what my soul thinkest Thinketh thee, there is no burden but should lightly lie. No duty but a joy at heart must be. Love's perfect will can be nor sore nor small. For God is light, in him no darkness is at all. So he's saying, like, it doesn't matter what the your external circumstances are. Yeah. Love's, it's love's perfect will and in god there is no darkness at all yeah i think he's kind of saying like look on paper there is no reason for me not to go about freely yeah. and gladly because as he says in the in the previous stanza 22 that's when i highlighted because i really loved it with thee on board each sailor is a king nor I mere captain of my vessel then, but heir of heaven and earth, eternal child, daring all truth, nor fearing anything, mighty in love, the servant of all men, resenting nothing, taking rage and blare, into the godlike silence of a loving care. And I do love that because he recognizes his birthright as, as a human, as someone who partakes in the incarnation. And I think it is... A natural question to ask, like, if this is so, why don't I act then as if everything is glorified and fine? There is a misty twilight of the soul, a sickly eclipse. And so how do those two things become a whole, which he talks about? How do you unite this seemingly tension of the opposites where you have no reason not to gallop about happily and freely and be shining all the time because you are sharing in the incarnation of Christ. And yet, I cannot think in me is but a void. I have felt too much and want to feel no more. My soul is hungry for some poorer fare. And he's saying, these two things have, have almost like torn me apart. And so gather my broken fragments mm -hmm. into a hole, into thy basket for my golden bowl. Take up the things that I have cast away in vice or indolence or unwise play. Let mine be a merry all-receiving heart, but make it a whole with light in every part. And so the stanza that you read of like going about gladsome and free, that is still his ideal. And he's begging God to make that come about in him. But I don't think he's saying, like, you be, you have to go through that. 
You're probably right because he kind of blames himself for these things like vice, indolence, or unwise play. But they're there. And I think he is at least acknowledging that they're there. Yeah, he is. But he's not saying, like, you have to embrace that to appreciate God more. I don't think he's saying that. He might not be, and that's maybe where he and I are splitting apart, because I think you do. I mean, I think you can't, like, the 13th fairy is going to come. If you invite her, she might not come with such a vengeance. I think that um, I'm listening more to the Lord of Spirits because I'm really trying to understand the Orthodox worldview about hierarchies in the world and how the like Christ is the Lord of Spirits and how that has transfigured hierarchies but not abolished them. And I do want to return back to this Anglo-Saxon relationship and understanding of winter both inner and outer and whether or not George MacDonald would agree with all of that I guess I appreciate the vulnerability laid forth in this poem of his inner eclipse of his inner misty twilight of the soul I am happy that he wrote about it. He wrote about his wrestle with God. And maybe I don't mm-hmm. agree with his relationship with it. But I just love this. It's like two things in, in stanza 13. He says, two things at once thou knowest I cannot think. When busy the work, when busy with the work thou givest me, I cannot consciously think then of thee. Then why, when next thou lookest o'er the brink of my horizon, of my horizon, should my spirit shrink, reproached and fearful, nor to greet thee run? Can I be two when I am only one? And that just <laughs> seriously resonates with me. It's like this desire for spirit, but knowing that you can't just live in in your head all the time. You know, I like to think that if I had my wish. I would literally just read books all day and sit in a cafe and smoke a cigarette and talk about them with a little espresso and a little limoncello on the side. Like, no kids, no housework, no chores, or just, like, stare out the window thinking about this or, like, doing this podcast all the time. Now, I always check myself because, of course, that would get old. That's unhealthy, that's sickly, that is its own addiction, this addiction to spirit in this form. But I feel the tearing asunder of George MacDonald because it happens with me too. Like, I want to live in a small town and I want to live in the downtown of a huge metropolitan place. And there's a huge part of me that wants to be like a a badger with her babies and just nestle in the nest with the children all day and cook meals and so there is just this this pull I guess of these two opposite worlds in myself and I I can see that reflected in George MacDonald's poem here he wants to do his work he wants to be ordinary oh yeah here it is in stanza 11 Um, I will not shift my ground like Moab's king, but from this spot whereon I stand, I pray. From this same barren rock to thee I say, Lord, in my commonness, in this very thing that haunts my soul with folly through the clay, of this my pitcher, see the lamp's dim flake, and hear the blow that would the pitcher break. And so it's like he has been in the heights and the lofts. He's a poet. He sees things that other people don't see. But at the same time, he does, he recognizes that he is ordinary, that he has limitations, and he wants to be like that child who, having had adventures with new toys and playing with the servants, now he just wants to return to the mother's changeless breast. There's a part of him that's maybe tired of being in these these lofty heights that he's perhaps been as a poet and a storyteller, and as a writer, and a thinker. 
Oh, I was just reading about his biography, or I was reading his biography a little bit. And he did have a pretty tough life. I mean, it, sounded, it sounds like he wanted to to be a pastor, but then was basically forced out of that because of his unorthodox preaching. Hmm. So he became a writer because that's that was his only other option. And at that time had a had a his wife and us a girl infant girl so basically had next to nothing then but then he started to write and it sounds like he didn't start writing like his fairy tales until he became established and had enough like money to have breathing room so he could afford to fail mm. and that's when he started writing the fairy tales versus the more serious stories that he wrote that that was kind of interesting. Well, that is interesting. I feel like the Tempest, Shakespeare's Tempest, comes up a lot when I read George MacDonald, or I just, I see things there that are similar. And I guess when I hear that, I think that maybe for George MacDonald, writing was sort of a magical thing it was something that he had to resort to do to stay alive without completely losing his soul. Yeah. Which had this yearning to have a, a deep relationship with the divine, with spirit, with father as a preacher. And when that was so brutally denied him, he had to find a way to make magic out of that misfortune. Mm-hmm. And use his his poet's eye, which rolls back and forth, as we talked about in the first episode of this podcast. And there is a dark and shadow side to having a poet's eye that rolls back and forth. And I think that is reflected by Prospero in Shakespeare's Tempest, where Prospero uses his staff, his magic, to bring justice to himself and his daughter and to you know give his daughter basically what what he had lost which was rights to rule i mean she marries um yeah i I think yeah she marries the duke's son and, and and but but when that's accomplished he ends up breaking his staff and he says i i can't I can't do this anymore. And then, of course, he sets Ariel free, the spirit. And then I think Caliban, too, who sort of represents typically the more earthiness of, of human life and, and the passions and the instincts. He's sort of an animal figure. And so I, I guess I see that a little bit reflected in George MacDonald's poem here, which is, you know, he's had this long relationship with writing and fairy tales and magic, and he's used it and his eyes rolling back and forth. But He's kind of tired of that now, it seems a little bit. Like now he just wants the changeless mother's breast and he wants to do his work, but he also just wants to be in the light. And it's almost like he almost just wants it to be given to him a little bit now. You think so? <laughs> I do. Yeah, you know, I can like, see that. He's just that begging thigh. God, like, look, just shine down on me once in a while. <laughs> Like, I just, I just want to do my work and not forget you, but you have to, like, just shine down on me and warm me. And, like, I am basically reduced now to just this ember. Just don't forget me, <laughs> you know. I think he took up writing, though, to, like, still get his preaching across. Like yeah. Like, theology still, like, is coming across in that way. Yeah. No, he didn't. I love it because he didn't abandon himself completely. No. Like he stayed true to himself and it was almost like an alchemist in a way. I mean, he figured out how to stay alive, but not just survive, but also thrive. And yet, and yet that, that using of the staff has a dark side too or it can I don't know there is a shadow side to 
to having such an intimate relationship with his spirit through poetry and fairy tales and work and but it's like he also used that to survive and so how much of a part of him that is and I guess it's maybe a little tongue-in-cheek here because he is writing a poem about all of this you know like yeah. he's using this deep misty twilight of the soul and he's in relationship with it through poetry once again like it's like this thing saved his life once before when he was denied and had no money and had a wife and a daughter and man real life really slapped him in the face and so what came to his aid was writing. And February is here, winter's here, the sun's there, but it's twilight, which is its own form of torture. And he's he's using poetry again, I think, to maybe be a mead hall for him in this time. Yeah, could be. Yeah, I kind of get the sense that like it's pretty. It's a pretty humble poem that he's writing, for sure. You think that kind of if you're. In general, he is pretty humble. I think. Mm -hmm. You know, if he's. Writing to try to get his theology across, I think that's kind of rare to be so humble. Like he's not, professing to be like Martin Luther or anything. You know. Oh, totally, yeah. He's, he's very humble and honest with who he is, even though he's got so much wisdom. I think he's a, he is like Job. I mean, he is like Prince Ivan um, in the fairy tale with the wolf who fails and, and sits down and, and weeps and acknowledges the failure I don't think he's suggesting a 10-step formula to escape himself. No, I don't think so either. And that's so rare, and I think that is disappearing more and more in our, in our Catholic faith. I mean, and everywhere, really. I mean, I think so much of the response to Shadow Now... And I'm just going to talk about the Catholic faith because I am Catholic and I, I think that one should keep one's own, own house. And, but I think, you know, not only are Catholics unwilling to look at shadow anymore, but they're, when they do look at it, it's almost like their response is not to sit and weep and be purged by the tears, which are necessary, but it's almost like to to be militant about it and a 10 step program or i'm going to defeat this you know i'm going to pray it away like a like a military response and First of all, if you didn't if you don't sit with your own shadow, if you don't encounter winter, you're going to project it onto something else and and you're going to end up scapegoating someone or something else, which is a cruel thing to do. But if you also pass too quickly over the weeping part, you do not reap the fruits then or or it's not going this this shadow in this winter is not going to be a fertile time because you know prince ivan he weeps but it's part of the weeping that that gets him the gold it, it's psyche weeping when the eagles come it's it's sam and frodo destroyed the ring happy just to be with each other at the end of all things. And that's when the eagles come. And it's really hard, don't get me wrong, but I just love that George MacDonald does demonstrate that for us in this poem. Yeah, he does. He pretty much says it's up to God to put me back whole, you know? Mm-hmm. And he has, but it's not going to 
feel, I like what I think George MacDonald sometimes suggests in this poem. It's not going to feel like he is always glad some springing about because he knows he is, um, you know, partakes in the incarnation. I think, I think my point is, is that we're always going to have the hierarchies and winter is always going to come and there's always going to be the shadow side to having this poet's eye and the trickster and there's always going to be a time for weeping and to feel like Job and that that's okay because Christ has transfigured these these seasons and these hierarchies and these spirits and these shadows, but he hasn't gotten rid of them. Um, there's a response and a relationship with them, but they're, they will be here and we're not going to always be basking in the sun. I guess my question for you, Sean, is does this reflect how you think George MacDonald has like, approached death and other works of his? I first think about Sir Gibby. There's a chapter that's very powerful where Gibby's father dies. And, and Gibby is a child at that point. And his father is actually very cruel to him. But also loving in a way too and comforting for him. So I think in his stories, that story, I think Castle Warlock, the father dies in that as well. Um, he usually seems like he uses death to become like a passage for the sun, the shadow for the sun to overcome maybe. Hmm. Even when, like I said in Sir Gibby, from the outside one would think that it was a good thing that his father died. But I almost get the sense like he uses death to kind of highlight how you need to become like a child even more, mm -hmm. kind of. Mm -hmm. And maybe he, maybe there's a sense of that in the in the in this poem too, where he talks about the little child that's happy to the core, mm -hmm. leaving his mother's lap, and is the mother annoyed? Um, but then, why would? They not run straight to the mother with a new toy or a torn garment. Be thou father my delight. I think that's kind of what theme I'm thinking about, I guess, in his story is that the father figure is like just to be delighted in. And it's hard. It's hard to find that without having, like, a child in the story. And it's hard to... Like, the last line, the last two lines, let mine be a merry, all-receiving heart. I mean, that's like... That reminds me of a child, I guess. You almost have to have that, then, to... Yeah. To let God make it whole. So I think it does follow along with his, his stories and death and his stories that way. Yeah, that's really fascinating for me, I guess, because I've been thinking lately about the dark side of a child, our father complex, and how those two things are always on the same wavelength. A, a father complex requires a child complex. And at some point, you know, Pinocchio needs to become a real boy. And this is what's tragic about Peter Pan. But there is a golden side to that, too. Well, and I think George MacDonald's more the opposite, where it's like, you no, know, he doesn't have to become, like, he should stay a child. But, <clears throat> okay, 
there's a dark and sh- like there's a light and dark to a child though too you know i mean a- an adult can't be a child in 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 some ways and at the same time that is the great secret to all things like i'm thinking about the icon of um the door mission of the theotokos which i'm staring at right now it's across the kitchen table and christ is holding mary as a little girl and the child you know it it, yes the the divine child that is the core of each of us that is the secret um and so it's so it's so integral and in christ says let the little children come to me unless you become like a little child Mm -hmm. you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven but I think in order to get to that, there is something that has to happen to the wooden boy. Yeah. The wooden boy does have to die. I wish we had more time because this is probably a really big theme for George McDonald that we can uncover yeah, it certainly is. over our time because... Yeah, I, the child comes up a lot in his stories, and I guess just hearing you talking about how the death of the father is almost like a womb or a passageway. You said these children, like the, like they become more childlike. I mean, that's just kind of the sense I get a little bit. But... Yeah, but it's like that requires a death. Yeah. Of the father. <laughs> It's just so great. I mean, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because uh, George MacDonald starts this poet out by saying he uses this language as the bastard self. He also uses the word fatherless at some point very early on in the poem. Yeah, okay. In stanza three. Back still it comes to this. There was a man who said, I am the truth, the life, the way. Shall I pass on or shall I stop in here? Come to the Father, but by me none can. What then is this? Am I not also one of those who live in fatherless dismay? I stand, I look, I listen, I draw near. And so he's acknowledging his his father is gone. You know, like there is a a death of a father very early on. And this Mm -hmm. can bring about such despair and such selfishness and an incorrect childlike attitude. Self, self, the end, the goal of human bliss. But if the Christ self in us be the might of saving God, why should I spend my force with a dark thing to reason of the light, not push it rough aside, and hold obedient course. So it's like, it's like right from the beginning, he's like, I just need to shove this evil mood away and stay true to the course. And then in the end, he's like Job. He's just like, gather my broken fragments into a hole as these four quarters make a shining day. Into thy basket for my golden bowl. Take up the things that I have cast away in vice or indolence or unwise play. A child, let mine be a merry all-receiving heart, but make it a whole with light in every part. It's like he's sort of journeyed through this fatherlessness and this, this acknowledgement that he himself does not have the strength that he wants to just shove this darkness away Mm -hmm. and at the end he's just like make me whole yeah you know like i i don't have i i can't shove all these i can't shove winter away just make me whole Mm -hmm. and light the candle as the as like you know his angle his anglo-saxon ancestors had done in february light the candle or just make me a child, basically. Mm-hmm. Or I don't even care if it's cold. Yeah, with with light in every part. I mean, that's how mm-hmm. the the poem ends. Like February is in in you know these uh, in Roman Catholic and in Orthodox liturgical experiences, 
It is the month of candles of light. I think that's a good place to end. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy our content and are interested in helping us bring George McDonald back into the culture, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We have support levels for as low as $3 a month. So if you'd like to join in this work, we will always appreciate the support. You can also contact us at our website, georgemcdonaldandus.com, which we have a link to that in the show notes. If you like the podcast, please consider sharing it with a friend who you think may also be interested in. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, we are looking for listener suggestions, whether it's a poem George MacDonald wrote or a short story or even a sermon. We are interested in what readers um, are looking for. So thank you for listening. Thank you.